So, so far, through our journey in Hebrews, we have seen that Jesus is so much better than the prophets. For in these last days, God has spoken to us by his own Son. We have seen that Jesus is so much better than the angels. For to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstools. Jesus is so much better than Moses, who indeed was faithful in all his house as a servant, but Christ is a son over his own house. And Jesus is so much better than Joshua, for if Joshua has given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now we come to the priesthood of Jesus that, you guessed it, is so much better than the Levitical priesthood. The introduction and the transition to this topic, although we have heard twice already that Jesus is the high priest, the the introduction and transition to this topic and focus starts in chapter 4 and verse 14. So reading that verse, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. Jesus is our great high priest. He is God's great high priest. And if you weren't aware of this, he is the only one, and this is actually the only passage in all of the scriptures where the word great is put before the title high priest. There were many high priests throughout the years, but there is and will only ever be one great high priest, and that is Jesus. Jesus ascended. You know, we talk, or actually we don't talk all that much about the ascension, but the ascension is an important part of the gospel message. Jesus ascended and passed through the heavenly veil into the true holy of holies where today he sits and ministers as our great high priest, ever making intercession for you and for me. And unlike all the priests of the Old Covenant, all the priests of the Levitical system, Jesus is both fully man and fully God. He is the eternal great high priest. These Hebrew Christians were being brutally persecuted. They were under heavy, heavy persecution and suffering. And the call here is do not return to the Levitical priesthood, for we have a great high priest who is Jesus. Hold fast to your confession. Hold fast. To Jesus. And now the writer begins to expound upon this. In Hebrews 4 15 and 16, we read For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus was tempted in all points, but he never sinned. Not even once. This is a critical and fundamental doctrine of our faith. Jesus was absolutely, completely sinless in every way 
possible. There was no sin found in him. Jesus, who is fully God, was not capable of sin. But the temptation was very, very real. Listen, it is not necessary for a person to be prone to a sin for them to be genuinely tempted. That is, temptation that is presented does not cease to be real temptation simply because you are not going to give into it. You could be tempted even though you are not going to give into it. Jesus would not because he was at all times 100% God. Jesus did not cease to be fully God in his incarnation. He was 100% God and 100% man, and he was not capable of sin. Now, I would suggest to you, however, that his temptation was not only real, but his temptation was even worse than anything that you have ever experienced. Can you honestly say you've been tempted in all points? Have you been tempted in all points? Jesus was tempted in all points. And he was going to withstand any measure of temptation that came his way without sinning. You, however, would buckle. You, however, if you were under the level of temptation that Jesus experienced, you would buckle. Jesus would not. I love the story of the uh, train conductor, or actually it's the, the, build, the bridge builder, the foreman of the bridge. And he builds a bridge to spec. He builds it to hold the, the full weight of the train of this bridge. Before they're going to open the bridge to public use, they take a fully loaded train and they, and they set it across the, across the bridge. And when the foreman is asked, why would you do that? Are you doing that to see if it will fall? And he says, no, sir, I'm doing it to prove that it won't. Jesus was tempted to the full measure to prove that he would not buckle. He was the Son of God, the perfect Lamb, sinless and able to be our perfect sacrifice. I would suggest that if you were tempted to the same measure, you would buckle. But here is the promise of the Scriptures for us. 1 Corinthians 10.13 No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Christian, if you sin, if you buckle, if you give in to temptation, you have to understand something. You didn't have to. Now you will sin because you are fallen and you have not been made perfect yet. That happens in your new body. But the truth is that God has made a promise to us here that when I am tempted, he will make a way of escape. Sometimes, that's just not going to that particular place that you know is going to be too heavy for you. Listen, if you are an ex-alcoholic, if that is your history, if that is your past, and you have been born again and freed from alcoholism, should you go hang out on a bar? I mean, should you go and be spending your time in a bar? Would that make sense for you? Of course not. Part of the escape there is not going, not putting yourself in that place. But what if you're in a place that you didn't intend and someone breaks out some alcohol? Well, what should you do? I would say do like Joseph. Run! Get out! Get away! Don't keep playing cards or whatever you are. Just move out of that space. You will always have a way of escape. Jesus was under tremendous pressure. I would believe the entirety of his humanity experience was just 
under pressure, yet he never sinned even once. What does this give Jesus for us? One of the, when you read this, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with, with our weakness. Maybe one of the things that was kind of tantalizing or, 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 or uh, uh, pulling these Hebrews back to the old system was this idea that they could go to the priest and that he could sympathize with them. But Jesus, well, you know, he can't even sympathize with me. And the writer is reminding us, no, he can't sympathize with you. Jesus knows what you're going through. You know what you really should do when you feel tempted, when you want to sin, when there's something on your plate that feels too heavy? What should you do? Should you run to me? Should you go to the church building and knock on the door and try to talk to somebody? I mean, hey, we're here for you. No, go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Jesus can sympathize. Jesus knows what you're dealing with. Jesus knows your struggles. And he is able to help you. You know, grace isn't just something you received at the time of salvation. A lot of times we talk about grace as something that happened, something we received, and then we almost leave it over there as though we don't need continued grace. But grace is actually God's gifting and power to, to give you everything you need every moment of your life for the rest of your life. Grace is what you need continually from God. And we're told here that we can go to the throne of grace and receive what we need from Jesus. And we're not going to get this from him. What? Pfft. What's wrong with you? No, that's not, why are you even bringing this to me? You're just weak. Stop complaining. No, that's what you might get from me. But you're not going to get that from Jesus. You, I, you probably won't get that from me. It depends. If you bring me something stupid. But nothing stupid to Jesus. You get what I'm saying? I'm a human. But he's, he's God. He's been tempted in every point. And anything you bring to him, he can sympathize with you. You need to go to the throne of grace. You need to go to Jesus. Look at me, look at, uh, with me at chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. Getting into some details. For every high priest taken from among men is appointed for men in things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is also subject to weaknesses. Because of this, he is required as for the people so also for himself to offer sacrifices for sins. And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. So as we move into this comparison, which we've seen this process before, right? This comparison of Jesus to the prophets, of Jesus to the angels, of Jesus to Moses, of Jesus to Joshua, here, as we move into this comparison of Jesus as the great high priest to the Levitical priesthood, our writer, the Holy Spirit, wants to bring to light the job description of the Levitical priest. This is the job description of them. Uh, and so first off, he was taken from among men. Listen, the, the priest had to be a man. God didn't beam down an angel to be the priest for the men. He took a man. And we've already looked at, with ample uh, discussion, the humanity of Jesus. Jesus was true and perfect humanity. He wasn't a phantom or, or, or pretending to be a man. He is, and he became a man, and he will always be full, perfect humanity. He was appointed, this is the priest, he was appointed for the people... Uh, in things pertaining to God, to bring gifts and sacrifices. This was the primary duty of the priest, to bring gifts and sacrifices for the people. He did the work to make fellowship and communion between the people and God possible. He did that work. Well, Jesus himself became our sacrifice. He did all the work. And guess what? 
The work is finished. He finished that work. The priests needed to be able to show compassion and sympathize with the people. This was important to the people, and obviously the second time brought up here might have been a question of the people that are, are considering going back to the old system. Well, Jesus is able to have compassion and sympathize with us, having lived 33 years as a man, having gone through all of the challenges and trials of humanity. Jesus was was tired. Jesus was hungry. Jesus was uh, abused. Jesus was uh, uh, lied to, and he had he was sad, and he was hurt, and he had a friend die. I mean, Jesus had all of these experiences. He can sympathize with you. He can have compassion on you. And his own humanity, now this again is speaking of the, the, the earthly Levitical priest, his own humanity meant that he had to offer continual sacrifices for both the people and himself. And so here, the, the job description you know, brings out the uh, flaw or the uh, you know, what was missing or lacking, the disadvantage with the Levitical priesthood. He himself needed a sin offering for himself. And because the sin offering of a lamb or a goat was not complete, it only, it only temporarily covered the sin. It didn't wash away the sins of the people, so what did the people have to do? Come back over and over and over again. It was a bloody affair. And the priest had to continually offer sacrifices for the people. Well, this obviously was a disadvantage. And here's the thing. That system was never intended to be the answer. That system was just a shadow of things to come. That system was put in place to show us the the depth and the ugliness of our sin, the reality of our sin and the need for blood to be shed for sins to be taken care of. That was never the answer. That was simply a picture. It was a foreshadowing. Why? Because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Jesus has done the work once and for all. There is no sacrifice left to be made. Jesus is our perfect sacrifice. And finally, and really kind of the primary point, and you'll see that as we go through, is that no man can take the priesthood upon himself. You couldn't, if you were of the tribe of Judah, which Jesus was, Wake up one day and decide, you know what? I want to be a priest when I grow up. Well, you couldn't be. Only the tribe of Levi and only the lineage of Aaron. It was very specific. It was both chosen by God because not every descendant of Aaron was high priest. The one that God chose was high priest. But you also had to be a descendant of Aaron who was also a descendant of Levi. That was it. It was very specific. It was both through uh, lineage and through God's specific choosing. And now that's the case that we're going to see made for Jesus. Read with me Hebrews 5, verse 5 and 6. So also, Christ did not glorify himself to become high priest, but it was he who said to him, You are my son. There's the lineage. Today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Of Melchizedek. See, Jesus is the the lion of the tribe of Judah. Jesus, Jesus is not a Levite. Jesus could not become by the Levite, by the er, 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 Aaronic. That's, is that the right way to say it? <laughs> Aaronic? That's probably not right. By the Aaron lineage of priesthood. He, he could not be part of the Levitical priesthood. He was of the tribe of Judah. Now he is God's son. That's his lineage. right? 
But he is in the order of Melchizedek. See here, we find that that God actually chose Jesus, not Jesus didn't make himself that, God chose Jesus to be the great high priest. God the Father sent and ordained Jesus, God the Son, who put on perfect humanity and became our great high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Have you heard of Melchizedek? Have you heard of him before? Do you know who Melchizedek is? The quote here regarding Melchizedek is from Psalm 110, verse 4. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You know when God says that? What do you think that means? Uh, It's going to happen. It's for sure. If the Lord has sworn and will not relent, whatever he's about to say, you can bank on. You You can say this is for sure. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Now this here is a clear messianic psalm, and it's declaring the reign and the victory of Christ. And in it, God declares that Jesus is a priest for how long? How long is he priest? He's a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. That doesn't really tell us who Melchizedek is, though, does it? That doesn't really tell us. We actually got to turn to Genesis chapter 14 and look at verses 18 to 20 to see who Melchizedek is. And I'm going to read that if you want to turn there. You can turn there. Genesis chapter 14, verses 18 through 20. Here's our introduction, and until that psalm passage, all we ever hear about Melchizedek. This is such a crazy passage. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Man, is this crazy. Just that sentence. He was the priest of God Most High, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand, and he gave him a tithe of all. Now who tithed to? Abraham tithed to Melchizedek. Now what's going on here? Abraham had just come back from freeing Lot, his nephew, from the hands of four kings. You heard me right. Four kings. Four kings gathered together and came against five kings, one of which was the king of Sodom and one of which was the king of Gomorrah. And he, and he took, they actually beat them in battle and in The taking of the loot, guess who got nabbed? Lot. Lot got taken with all of these other nobles and with all of the stuff from these four kings who came against Sodom and Gomorrah and uh, several other kings. Abraham hears about this. Now, is Abraham considered a king? Does Abraham have a city that he's the king over? Nope. Abraham has himself. And the servants born in his house, and they gather together and go after these four kings. That's nuts. That just goes to show how strong and powerful Abraham was at this time. Because what happened? They overtook them, they beat them down, and they freed Lot and everything that they had stolen from these kings. And on their way back, out comes Melchizedek from the from the uh, from Salem. Now, what is Salem? Salem is the early name of what would become Jerusalem. So the the king priest Melchizedek is the king of Jerusalem. Now remember, this is more than 600 years before the Levitical priesthood would come into into existence through Moses. This is 600 
years before that. You know, when I read things like this, I go, there's a lot I don't know about. There, there's a lot I don't know about. God tells us what we need to know about, but there's a lot I don't know about. So who is this guy? Who is this guy, Melchizedek? Well, his name means, my king is Sedek, or king of righteousness, king of right, king of righteousness. That's what Melchizedek means. And he is the king of Salem. Well, Salem, again, which is an early name for Jerusalem, but Salem means peace or peaceful. So he is the righteous king over peace. He is the king of righteousness reigning over peace. And he is the priest of the Most High God. He is the Most High God's righteous priest king of peace. Let me, let me read that for you again. Here's who Melchizedek is. He is the Most High God's righteous priest king of peace. Who does that make you think of? Who, who does that sound like? Would you not attribute all of that to, to Jesus? Does that not sound exactly like who Jesus is? Now, we kind of got to put a pause on Melchizedek here because we're actually not going to really talk more about him until chapter 7. But that's who Melchizedek is. So, so put that in your memory bank. Pull out those, those notes again. Maybe I'll recap when we get there. But until we get to verse 7, we're not going to really talk much more about Melchizedek. But here's what I want to sort of finish with this morning. Boy, I'm, I'm going to be done early this morning. Don't get used to it. Do not get used to it. This will never, ever happen again. I promise you. As mentioned before, the main point here is that Jesus was ordained by God to be our great high priest. His ordaining came through the order of Melchizedek. He is of the priesthood of Melchizedek. Jesus is king, isn't he? And Jesus is our great high priest. And Jesus reigns forever. He is our great high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. At his ascension, he passed through the heavenlies, through the heavenly veil into the holies of holies, the holy of holies. He sat down at the right hand of the Father, and he is now positioned as our great high priest forever. God made Jesus the great high priest. And it's forever. There is never going to be another priest. Jesus stands alone. There is no other religion. No, pastor, don't, we're not a religion, right? Listen, the religion is Christian, biblical Christianity. And it is the only religion by which we have a great high priest forever, who sits in the heavenlies. Every other religious institution, apart from Christ, is false. Every priesthood that is set up is false. There is only one priest. There is a dominant religion in the world that puts a great deal of emphasis on their priesthood. In Jesus' days, they called them the Nicolaitans. Today, it is Catholicism, and I'm afraid to say, it's false. There's one priest. Now, we are, there's one great high priest. If you think the pastor is the one that you need to go to, you set him up as a priest. It's Jesus you go to. And then what about all the people that make themselves the priest? I'm going to find my own way to God. I'm going to make my own way. You know, that's fine for you, however you believe God to be, but, but God to me, or the way I think God is, or my God, 
How many times have you heard that? Have you ever spoken to someone and hear them speak of that way? They're making themselves the priest. They're making themselves the one who goes between man and God. And they're going to tell you who God is. Listen, the, the Jesus of the Scriptures is the only Jesus that can save. And He is the only great high priest. There is no other way. Jesus is the only way. And this really is the primary point of these passages. Jesus is now and will forever be the only great high priest. This is really important to understand as we move into chapter 6. We're going to move into an area of Scripture that is difficult. And the primary interpretation, understanding of that passage really rests on here. These Jewish believers were being tempted to go back to the old system. And they knew that that system had been ordained by God. They knew that God had chosen it and had, had set it up. And that he chose the tribe of Levi. And that he chose the lineage of Aaron. And that in the lineage of Aaron, he chose which man would rise to be the great high priest, or pardon me, the high priest within that system. And they knew this. And the writer here is making it very clear that although that is true, Jesus was chosen to replace that system. And he is the great high priest, chosen of God. And if you depart from him, you have nowhere to go. You cannot return to that system. You can't return to any other system. And to return to it, to, to leave Christ and to return to that system, that's called apostasy. And we'll read about that maybe, maybe next week. A positive. But I want to close with this in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 6. Therefore I exhort first of all that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence, for there is Good, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. We have been given the gospel. We have been given the good news. Jesus has been made our great high priest. He is the mediator between God and man. He gave himself a ransom for, for how many? For all. For all. And it is God's desire that all men would repent and trust Christ for their salvation. That is God's desire. See, this news that there is only one high priest, it's not bad news. It's not, it's not news that should make us say, what, there's only one way? There's only one priest? No, he's the great high priest. You need no other. He's the only one that you would ever need and will ever need. If you were in a burning house, fire everywhere, and I came to you and said, listen, listen, I know the way out. Would you be like, there's only one way? Never mind, I'm going to stay in the burning house. If there's not at least two ways, I think all these ways that I'm looking actually lead out. No, that's ridiculous. No, if you were in a burning house and I was to show you the way out, you would want to take that way, wouldn't you? Listen, the world is, is burning. 
The world is on fire. We know the way out. There is only one way. But we know the way out. And the wonderful truth of that way is that you can share that with anyone and everyone knowing that if they place their trust in Christ, that he will save them. And he will be their high priest. And he will make intercession for them. And he will be their mediator between God and them. And they will be reconciled unto the Father. You can give that message to anyone and everyone you meet with full confidence that if they trust Christ, if they repent of their sins, and if they trust Christ, He'll save them. He'll save them. So what are we to do? Come boldly to the throne of grace. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. And what do you do when they say, what must we do to be saved? Take them to Jesus. Take them to Jesus. It's about Jesus, guys. It's always been about him. It'll always be about him. It's for him and through him and by him and to him. It's about Jesus. Let's pray.